go along. Well, good good afternoon, just everyone. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, if you're new to the IBE, welcome to the IBE. Uh, we we exist to champion the highest standards of ethical behaviour in, in business, and we do this through a variety of channels. Uh, we run networks, we deliver training and provide advisory services. Um, we, uh, we issue publications and we run a series of events, including, uh, in including this one. Um, and for those of you who have been around following our events for a while, um, this might remind you of uh, Yogi Berra, the, the Yankees catcher, his comment that it feels like deja vu all over again. Uh, because yes, indeed it is. This is a it, this is a repeat, backed by popular request, uh, a to for us to talk about the Edelman Trust Barometer. Edelman, for those who don't know the organisation, is a global communications firm, uh, six thousand people, sixty offices, and uh, Edelman are in the twenty second year of tracking global cycles of trust. Um, this is, uh, we're, we're still new to the game. It's only the third year that we've, that we've run a, a webinar with Edelman to talk about um, the, the, the insights from the trust barometer. Um, but, you know, over time, uh, there's a lot for us to think about. The, we have seen, um, you know, the, the barometer has tracked the steady collapse of trust in government and the media uh, and the growing demand for business to engage more actively on the, the big issues in society. Um, and if we thought that was hard a few months ago when we sort of scheduled this, thinking uh, about you know, how do you work out uh, from all the, the big topics that are available, climate change, social justice, everything that was front of mind at the beginning of the year, um, well, it's become ever, even more complicated so as the world uh, tipped on its axis through the invasion of, of Ukraine. Um, again, as Yogi Berra said once, uh, the future ain't what it used to be. Um, the, so there's a whole range of new issues and challenges for business, uh, engaging on the right issues, producing the right response at the right time uh, is harder than ever and the stakes are higher than ever. So to help us face into that, um, uh, open up the discussion and to help us frame uh, the, the, the context for this. I'm delighted to be joined by, again by Mark McGinn. Um, Mark is the Executive Director of Sustainability, Social Impact and Purpose at Edelman. Um, and before joining Edelman, uh, Mark was, in, in, earlier in his career, was um, Head of Sustainability Marketing at O2 and uh, led um, international marketing and communications for Red, the conglomerate of brands that, uh, uh, that fight AIDS. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Mark, and welcome Mark, I'm going to ask Mark to uh, spend a little bit of time um, going through some of the key slides from the Trust Barometer. The slides that you will see uh, are part of a broader set of slides that is available on the, at the Edelman website, but we'll show, we'll give you a link to, we'll give you these slides, but we'll also give you a link to the, the main barometer, which has some of the, more about the methodology and some additional slides that certainly have some interesting insights in relation to what's going on in, 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 in North America. Um, as we go through, we want this to be an interactive session. Uh, there'll be plenty of time for uh, question and answer. So if you do have, uh, well, certainly time for questions. If you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, not the chat box. The, the, the chat box is where you should, if you're having any technical issues, please put your question in the, in the chat box and Joe and Alex will try and help you out. But the questions for, uh, for, for, for Mark and I, please put them in the, in the Q&A box. And as those rack up, we'll be able to um, vote for the ones that, that we like. Um, finally, just a reminder, this is being recorded. This, will, this webinar will be available sort of on demand on our website and on our YouTube channel fairly shortly afterwards. And uh, we, well, not me, um, beyond my capabilities, but my colleagues will be live tweeting as we go through. And 
um, Joe is uh, is going to put in the chat box. May already have done so. She has done great. Um, the the uh, the Twitter handles that you can use there. So uh, let's start off with some slides from Mark. Welcome again, Mark. And if you could take us through um, the the slides that you've selected, uh, and then we'll open it up for discussion afterwards. That would be great. Great. Thank you, Mark, and thanks for welcoming back, and, and um, thank you everyone joining for giving us time to talk to you this morning. Um, so we're going to walk through some slides now that are taken from Edelman's Trust Barometer, and just to give you a bit of clarity, um, these were fielded, these questions that uh, populate these, the answers that populate these slides were fielded in 28 countries uh, back in November in 2021. So there's more than 36,000 people around the world who fed into this data set. So it's a pretty robust data set and it's the, the 22nd year um, of us running this. Of course, it was quite a unique year in that it was the second year in which we were living in a global pandemic. And so this research was really looking at how that really forced these institutions. We look at four institutions and tested them in ways that um, was unprecedented. Um, as Mark mentioned, of course, since we scheduled this webinar, uh, another global event has also occurred, which is ongoing, which has also tested institutions further. So I'm sure we'll discuss potential implications of that, although some of that's too early to say. Um, what we did see, of course, and we'll walk through now, is that along with the pandemic, pandemic there were other existential threats and crises that um, are more present in people's minds, such as climate change and uh, the job threats are underway through the economic um, the hurdles we're now hitting, uh, the future shape of the economy with automation and what that means for jobs and discrimination, which really is not only testing the institutions, but also exposing reefs, rifts and weaknesses in the system itself. So we go on one slide, please. And perhaps that can be um, kind of surmised best in really describing what we're seeing now is a bit of a cycle of distrust. And um, we need to think hard about how we break out of that, how we move beyond that, and we restabilize. Um, and when we looked at the data sets um, and the data points, it felt like the cycle of distrust was really being fueled by um, a real failure of trust in the media and also in government. So we go on one more, please. So when we look at um, uh, the trust levels overall, trust has declined. Uh, you know, badly uh, for business, uh, for the government and media. And business still remains the only trust institution, which was true last year. On the right-hand side of this slide, there is an interesting little um, kind of bubble that came through in May. We did a short burst in May, only 11 countries for that May burst in 2020, where, you know, we're in the middle of the pan pandemic response still, government had had this uplift uh, because we were relying so heavily on, you know, institutions response across society in an unprecedented way. However, as things then panned out, as the pandemic continued, and some of the failings of those responses, as well as successes, but some of the failings too, um, became more apparent, that has then swept away. And actually government has gone to what has been a long-term trend, which is actually a declining trust in government as an institution. Um, so would we go on one more slide again now, please? Now, when it comes to media, we have a concern, which we have spoken to you guys about last year, which is this rise of, um, fake news, this understanding of fake news, but also perhaps a slight sense amongst peoples of this um, ever increasing rise of disinformation. What's the interesting about this question is not only that they're aware it's there, but how much fear there is in it actually the harm it can cause. And this question is, you know, pretty strong about it being used as a weapon. And you can see globally there's a four point increase in that. So, you know, we've got 76% globally agree with this statement. And it's almost across the board within the countries we are looking at. And it's a record high in 13 of the 27 countries that we are looking at um, see this danger of false news and fake information um, that is actually a weapon against their own country, their own interests, but also um, themselves. They feel threatened by this misinformation. Now, when we turn and look at what's happened with government and why is government not trusted, it's a different reason. It's just simply their level, their perception of their level of competence and their ability to actually solve societal problems. And when we look at the level, the, uh, the response to whether they can take a leadership role and more importantly, whether they can deliver against plans and execute plans to provide solutions, they've declined further 
than we saw last year. They already, uh, last year it's gone worse. And um, perhaps they'll be very disappointed to see that they're getting the results was so poor, knowing that, you know, the, the level of government intervention over the pandemic is so high. And yet the public are not um, confident that that has been executed well. As you'll see also, of course, business is holding a very strong position. And not only is it held leadership role, uh, along to NGOs, but also the most competent to deliver the results that we need to see to address the challenges. So we go on one more. Then more broadly, we then see uh, that they have, you know, institutions are failing some of the existential threats that are out there. Uh, you go on one more slide, please. Uh, Great, thank you. Um, so there, are, so we, that's across the board. We're seeing this as a significant uh, rise and a significant concern because obviously that is a reflection of people's sense that the system is either working or failing, or the system is stalling in, the, in its measures as as in its entirety. Um, again, we see that the majority in thirteen countries including our 2021 spring update, so that each is not doing well in addressing either the pandemic or climate change. So the culmination of this, we go into one more slide, is that we end up in this cycle of distrust. And that is quite threatening to societal stability. Um, we see the government and media are feeling a, a sense of division, maybe perhaps for votes, pursuit of votes, and disinformation in a pursuit of clicks. Um, and with that, it leaves a quite a huge strain and pressure for NGOs and business to step in and take on some societal responsibilities, perhaps in some cases beyond what should be their remit and perhaps beyond their ability. So in all areas, that system now feels heavily strained and without um, each, each of those institutions supporting one another. So we need to look at how we can rebuild some of the societal stability that we need and, and stabilize this cycle and reverse that trend. So we go on, what, what's, what's you know, at heart perhaps here of this cycle of distrust? Well, really we're seeing a failure of leadership that is then making distrust the default, that is where people are turning to um, rather than turning to a place of trust to begin with any situation or any conversation or any interaction with any of these institutions. So we move on one more slide, please. So we see that societal leaders are, are not trusted. And some of this trend, again, is not uh, new this year, which has been a long-term trend, but unfortunately it is continued. Um, so none of the traditional society leaders are trusted, less than half trust governmental leaders, journalists or CEOs. Um, and then when we see the most trusted type of person, we measure as a scientist, that's not surprising in the last two years, that's been a trend we've seen before, the re return to valuation, to value of expertise has been clear. Um, followed immediately by colleagues and the employer CEO. And that's really significant. You know, this localized trust, the role of my employer and my leadership of my employer, the CEO and leadership team, is really significant. And it's the first indication that employers have a cru crucial role to play as a stabilizing force in society as we try and correct that cycle of distrust. Now, when we look at some of those, you know, that class that are distrusted now, the, the CEOs, the government leaders, the journalists, we did see some very worrying trends this year. In fact, it's not on this slide, but we did see a really significant increase in the belief that they're actively, deliberately lying to us. Not they're just not just distrusted, but they're, act, they're engaged in um, uh, misinformation. They're engaged in misdirection. Um, Two thirds actually say they now believe that journalists and government leaders are deliberately lying. And business leaders are not too far behind. So we have to take that very significant, you know, significantly, that, that finding and very seriously how we address that. In particular, we saw a huge increase in government leaders, uh, the belief that they are actually deliberately saying uh, falsehoods and knowingly spreading falsehoods. There was a nine point increase for government leaders, which is a pretty shocking performance. Um, uh, in the UK, of course, that perhaps is less surprising with some of the uh, current investigations that are underway. The result of that, if we go to the next slide, is we do see a record trust gap between high and low incomes. Again, this has been a long-term trend, 
Um, but the, the highest level we've seen, a 15 point gap between the two groups. So the high incomes are the top 25 percentile, um, and they've had significant trust gains over the last 10 years. Um, they are seeing a system that they feel works for them. And they are often people who have a greater level of education and we would determine them to be a more informed audience. They also will consume more news outlets and will have a greater range of news sources than others. The low income respondents, which is a low at the bottom 25 percentile, they continue to lag in distrust with no significant increase over the last 10 years. And this income-based divide, trust divide, is actually a global phenomenon. It's prevalent across geographies and political and economic divides, um, which is really startling that this is, we're seeing this as a global phenomenon. And therefore, we're seeing two versions of truth be existing within each of our geographies and within our societies. And we go on one more slide, please. So not surprisingly, of course, where does that leave us? It leaves us within people questioning the system itself. And um, this slide is perhaps a slide that will uh, have some change since we were out in November in the last four or five weeks, perhaps. Um, when we look at the levels of trust in Western style democracies, they've been in decline. And they've been in decline for the uh, last few years and it continues that what was the trend back in November uh, to see that decline further. I'm mentioning that this may not be uh, the same now because of course the situation we're in has put sh um, sharp contrast on the world and uh, perhaps when it feels like people are moving towards a common cause, a common enemy, um, perhaps with greater clarity about a sense of values in their nationhood, um, this may be slightly different uh, when we go back in November this year. But this was a performance in November 2021. Again, something we should take great note of is how people feel the system is working for them. Um, that includes, of course, business. So if we go on one more slide, the implications of that is that societal leadership is now a core business function. You know, amid this collapse of trust in much of the world, business and business leaders are being asked to take on a growing responsibility for addressing societal problems. Um, so it leaves us with a completely new um, function and responsibility in our roles. Now we go on one more slide. I don't think it's any shock to anyone to see that this is true across all stakeholder audiences and we're now being as business leaders held accountable for this. Uh, we are being held accountable for taking a stand on issues that align with you know often our customers values and beliefs. We were true also for our employees who are demanding that they believe the place they work mirrors the values they want to see in the world. And true as well for retail investors, as well as institutional investors. Um, we see it's common across all those stakeholder groups. And we go on one more slide. I'm gonna focus on that employee player relationship, which we're seeing trust being heavily localized, people near me, people I know, that includes the company I work for and the boss I have. Um, and that role of employer, it is incredibly trusted, and we've seen this rising all over the world um, for every individual. And the part, the role it plays, therefore, is, as we mentioned, the stabilizing force in a world that feels very fluid and turmoil, in which the truths and hard facts are hard to find, but the employer is becoming hugely influential. So when we go on one more slide, we find the employer media, so when we're sharing news out to our workforces through various channels of our own, is the most trusted, it's the most credible source of information. 65% believe the information from their employer after seeing it just once or twice um, is believed, uh, which is higher than the information from government or any other media source. Uh, at the other end of this spectrum, it's also worth noting the level of trust in social media and the distrust, more importantly, in social media. Um, with 27%, nearly one in three, and they will never believe anything they have only seen on social media. So we go on one more slide. It means that the CEOs, they really are expected to be the face of change. You know, this is a, a, a role that some are embracing, some are uh, uncomfortable with, but we have to accept there's a new expectation there um, and that they would personally lead and change and be visible with that. Eight in 10 believe CEOs should be visibly discussing public policy with external stakeholders or work their company does for society. 
And then six in 10 employees expect their company CEO to speak publicly about controversial issues they care about, to step up and be vocal. And expectation has increased by five points um, since we asked, last asked the question in 2019, which is a significant uplift. With that, though, we go to the next slide. There's a bit of caution, too. And this is obviously difficult and delicate to manage, which is it's really about informing the policy, maybe not the politics. You know, CEOs are expected to help inform and shape the conversation and pub policy debates on a range of issues. And 70% or more believe CEOs should inform and shape conversations around subjects specifically related to business, you know, jobs, automation, wages, and so on. But the majority also want CEOs to weigh in on societal challenges, such as climate change, immigration, perhaps even education and healthcare systems um, that we're all part of. However, the only topic which is below majority expectation is when CEOs engage in elections or politics itself. Who should be the next leader of the country, for example? It's important that we engage in shaping policy, but they may take care to stay out of politics. You know, when we think back of the daily press conferences during COVID times, you know, the way that, um, that our various scientific advisors stood side by side with ministers and prime ministers, but delivered the hard facts, the hard truths, the advice and did never pass judgment on the policies of the government at the time or the opposition were offering at the time um, is much the role that they'd like to see CEOs playing. So when we go on, let's think about, okay, well, let's break out the cycle of distrust. We need to move, we need to think hard about how we move beyond it. We, this is clearly not sustainable and it clearly would lead to unrest um, and, and worse. So how can we break out? How can we create a more stable society built on trust? Let's move on one more slide, please. So as government worsens further, it's critical that NGOs and business step in and act as stabilizing forces. And when we look at the four institutions that we, when we look at our, this trust survey, we do look at, which is the media, the NGOs, business and government, and based on their level of competence and, like the, and their ethical performance, we see that it is only business and NGOs who, see, who people believe are both ethical and competent to deliver that we see a really striking gap between what the business's level of performance, its ability to deliver on, on plans, on visions it has for what good could look like, to government's ability to deliver, which is 53 point gap and it's, and it's competent levels. That is enormous and stretching and growing. What we have seen in the result of the pandemic, probably not surprisingly because of the situation we lived through, was thankfully NGOs have moved um, along, you can see here on the x-axis, to be regarded to be more competent than they were a year ago. A year ago, only business was regarded to be both competent and ethical. So now business and NGOs have moved in a positive direction and government has moved further out into being regarded as being income, in, unable to deliver what it needs. It does, of course, then mean there's a bit more pressure and expectation on business to deliver. So we move on one more slide, please. And do they want business to deliver? You know, we asked this question, we want to check whether business had reached the limit of how much it should be doing in society, whether people thought we were overstepping. Have we gone too far up our swim lane? Have we lost focus on what business is here to do? And what we found that is that across every single issue and by a huge margin, people wanted business to engage more, not less. They wanted business to step in more and take on the challenge and have a point of view on the issues, the big issues that we're facing into. Um, they also obviously course see that business is going to be critical to building and delivering the solutions. 52% say business is not doing enough on climate change, for example, while only 9% say it's overstepping. It's a 43 point difference. And it's not dissimilar across the board. It's very clear the message we're being, the, being asked by the public. So we move on one more slide, please. And we should remember that we've just seen the previous slide there, two slides ago, that of course, business and NGOs are seen as competent and effective driver of positive change. That's good, that's excellent. They also are seen as having visionary ideas. They actually come up with the ideas that we need to overcome, or the scale of the idea is equivalent to the scale of the problem we're facing into. But we shouldn't overlook the minus seven here, which is a negative score for fairness. We mustn't be complacent. We must see that there is an issue here about the belief in whether business always is serving the interests of everyone, 
equally and fairly. And that probably stems from perhaps some cynicism about our commitments and our rhetoric versus our performance. And some of that cynicism is very grounded and true and has good warrant that we have been probably, the, 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 the say-do gap has been uh, significant across the board of most institutions, but perhaps they see it most in business. So move on one more slide, please. So when we ask questions about, you know, what do you see from business, the UK now rather than global, by the way, just to be clear on this slide, this information you're seeing, we see high scores of people who are tired of hearing commitments without action. For people who want to hear more about this is, are doing to positive impact, but you know, they, they, they want to know what the impact has been, the progress so far. And there's a low level of belief that we're actually genuinely trying to impact society. In summary, it's about demonstrating tangible action. And it's about moving beyond the words. You know, I know we've been saying this for some time, but really it's critical now because of the way we are, the cycle we're in. If we can get this right, move on to the last slide, please. We should be able to get to a place where we change that cycle. We should be able to get to a place where we restore some stability. We should be able to get to a place where we can restore trust, which is critical to that societal stability and restore the ability for the four institutions to function well as a system supporting one another. Yeah, and we need to recognize that business, that we take on that societal role and it's here to stay. People do want more business leadership, not less. And people want to see that happening through tangible progress, through action, rather than grand statements. They want a, a reason to believe the system can work to build a better future. And that societal leadership should demonstrate long-term commitments to addressing the issues, from sustainability to jobs, to fairness, to inclusion. And all the institutions, it's not all of us, we must provide consistent fact-based and trustworthy information that we must get through this default position of distrust that unfortunately has emerged in the recent times. So I hope that gives us some provocations and some data points through which we can then uh, have a good discussion with each other now. I think I've just lost the light in this room, unfortunately. <laughs> well, th thank you, Mark. Um, the, there's a lot to reflect on that. And as a, as a reminder, yes, we, we, we'll, we'll certainly uh, make the slides uh, available. Uh, in fact, the full slides are, are, are already publicly available on the uh, uh, on the Edelman um, website. Uh, in, in, in any event, but um, we're, we're very happy to do that. And yeah, loads to to think about. Um, I think the you know the collapse in trust in media. You know, it just feels like an awful long way back. Um, I don't know if you know. Many of us will have seen that sort of look up from Denzel Washington the other day, uh, bemoaning the, you know, the, what I think it was, he was describing as the battle to be first. Um, and, you know, as the media has got very short term horizons and it's all being out, all being about being, being out first with the story, you know, his, his uh, as he put it, you know, the problem with media is, 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 is with engagement with media is, that you're uninformed if you don't, and you're misinformed if you do. Now that's sort of a pretty gloomy view of the world, but um, do, you, do you share his uh, inherent pes pessimism? Um, yeah, I think um, I wouldn't want to be as pessimistic because um, uh, I think I'm just, I'm just a more optimistic person generally in life, but I think there's lots of truths in what he said. And I think there also is, what we are seeing is, is the public of science is, the public is starting to differentiate now better than they did media and media channels. They are certainly separating social media out from media outlets. And there is a greater need for us to really help people understand what media literacy, media competence should look like. And what I mean by that is that we should be challenging people to you know, consider different sources, consider different outlets, consider why they're writing information and why they're sharing it. Um, he's absolutely right that the hunt for clicks, which is, you know, so much of the modern online landscape is built for, the way the world, that, that digital world has been built right now, the algorithms that have been built into it, it, it is unfortunately a world that is currently uh, encouraging clickbait. It's encouraging speed of publication. It's encouraging brevity of publication. It's encouraging 
um, uh, the most sensational story, picture, headline, whatever you might give to just draw tra traffic in and with far less concern about the depth of the content, the, the veracity of the information. What we, I think, we need to make sure we do do is that the institutions that are still delivering meaningful journalism, the institutions that are still investing in ensuring that the integrity of their sources and their information um, are supported and that we are encouraging all of us to understand what um, kind of good information hygiene is, that we're, we're challenging ourselves not to be lazy um, and we're challenging ourselves to think about sources, think about um, our support of those institutions that are still doing the job of trying to find the truths, trying to find the facts. Um, but I also agree that it's, um, that's quite an ask in a world which is, you know, with an overwhelming amount of information right now um, and with young people growing up in it, which without much truthfully, much guidance about how to navigate through that. Well, and, and when it's navigated for you in that, in, in the, you know, these channels appear to be benign open channels, but actually you're being directed down a, a you know, a channel with ever, <clears throat> ever more re reinforcement of the view that you've expressed, that you've shown an interest in. So it takes you to more polarized. Um, That's right. The deep silos. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, um, uh, that's, that's certainly worrying. Um, we, we've had a, gosh, we're getting some questions. I've got to work harder with my scroll. <laughs> um, actually, we had a question in, well, we had a technical question, so let's do that one quickly while we're, uh, while we're going about, uh, uh, it's an interesting question. You know, does, does the lack of trust in government, uh, you know, to what extent country by country, does it, does it correlate with the, with the level of control of, uh, over the media? Uh, oh, there's some interesting correlations there. There are, and uh, you know, we're not naive as well, but in certain countries, answering a survey is challenging. You know, the, the, the correlation between those countries that are controlling the media is probably of course a correlation about how freely people feel, uh, feel able to express themselves. So we're, we're really mindful that some of those results, for example, China had a huge uplift in trust. Um, I'm not saying that if you're in China, you don't believe that, we're also mindful that in China, your ability and your general societal norm to be able to answer freely a survey is slightly different to other countries. So I think there is a there is a correlation, and um, certainly the kind of central command economies and, and countries have in this data set, they perform well compared to democracies in in recent years. Um, uh, we're mindful, though, as I said, about the skew that could happen in the way we are delivering surveys and asking people that that might be. Uh, over indexing. We had another quite, we had a question in advance, which I want to make sure that I don't miss. That would be a bit awful if somebody submitted a question in advance. We don't get to it. Um, it and it was about what's required from the, from the, from the, you know, the, the, the banking and finance sector uh, in, in terms of, uh, yeah, I suppose ethical leadership standards, given the, the continued collapse of trust in government and the media. And I wonder if I might sort of yeah, broaden it a bit uh, it, 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 and relate it to, you know, those organisations in society like the, 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 the banking and finance sector that are sort of key to the operation of society. What, what special responsibilities do those folk have? Yeah, great question. And I... I think fundamentally it's probably, it's not just, it's, it's probably constant with virtually all companies and all sectors, but particularly for finance and any regulated industry, regulated because they are so enormous and they feel to most people, citizens, that they're, they're almost too big to move. They feel a bit impenetrable to impact. And so what they have to continue to um, not only, uh, show more importantly to do is that a mindset that puts the client's interests and that includes societies widely and more broadly first and accepts that that may impact its own profitability to a smaller extent if it does that consistently and i think that you know in many industries particularly finance you know all the scandals that have arisen is when there's been ethical lapses that come back to an action that you know, perhaps reverse this priority and put the bank's book first. 
and it seemed to neglect you know really its its original function which is to serve its clients and that is not just of course finance that is all industries um where we have to and you know it just means that not only are we stay, saying that we need to make sure those cultures and structures in place that means that the individuals working as institutions feel empowered to not only make avoid and understand what are the wrong choices but also to make the right choices and make the right choices in front of or, and despite perhaps other colleagues moving the other way um, and that's a you know really important cultural challenge that you know should be owned by all leaders in all sectors but perhaps particularly those who have um, if there's been experience in recent years where it hasn't worked that way that needs to be overcome yeah and I think there's you know there's a there's a there's a cultural risk that we're all familiar with that you know when you go through a big problem like that and suddenly you've got an awful lot of behavior codified every day to try to ensure that people don't do the wrong thing you know I think a really important question for leadership is are we empowering people enough to do the right thing yeah uh, absolutely you're right any of these many of these high re highly regulated businesses post financial crisis do not do not feel like particularly empowering yeah uh, environments and, and uh, you know most of the time where you're wanting people to do the right thing it's because you know it's a situation where there's ambiguity and uncertainty and where the outcomes the logical outcomes for, for following the defined process don't get you to what seems objectively the right answer uh, yeah so yeah um, the, we, we had a, a question about the, um, the, the sort of leadership model, if you like, post, uh, uh going forward, I, you know, who should take responsibility for the development of a new generation of, of CEOs and, and leaders, and how do we put truthfulness mm. in integrity and ethical behavior ahead of everything else. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, one, of, one of my hopes, one of my lasting hopes for the, for the um, f f as an aftermath of the pandemic was the, you know, the value that we'd seen of, of, of ethical leadership, the, the um, you know, the, the importance, particularly of empathetic leadership, that that was going to be a lasting um, yeah. leg. People would have seen the value of that. What, what, what are your views? I think it's a great question. First of all, I think it's a brilliant question. I think that um, I think we should remember context. That I believe, and, and if I'm wrong, please someone correct me in the chat. I believe that by 2030 we would just hit a tipping point where, it, it by mod, the current modelling, is that we'll then finally have the majority of leadership teams in a slightly broader sense who are millennial for the first time. And I mentioned that because the, we know the millennials bring a new value set even more than the generations that follow, Gen X and Gen Z rather, but the millennials do bring a new value set. So we have a generation coming through who do represent, who do arrive professionally to work with different values, which are prioritized more. So that's the context we're in. So some of this is gonna happen because there's an organic transformation, which we all experience and we're experiencing today in our workplaces, which is good, but they need to be empowered and they need to be uh, given sh shape in the organizations and also mentors and role models that also demonstrate that is the behavior we'd like to see and that we're empowering that behavior. So there's clear, there are institutions out there. We know that, you know, there are some great institutions. I know that, for example, Prince Charles has got a lovely leadership um, uh, program running with the Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership. Um, there are others, and there are many others, in fact, where we are trying to reframe, you know, the considerations of what a leader is. And moving away perhaps from you know charismatic solo leader to collective leadership to try moving away to the considerations of what is a successful business and being more thoughtful about that i think it's also beholden to current leaders to reflect on what perhaps has gone wrong in uh, the last few decades and the leadership they'd like to see coming through to their successes and as they mentor those successes they maybe don't replicate what they were told at that point in their careers, but they work hard to share a vision of what they'd like to see the business being and, and be brave about that vision they're laying out for the successes. And um, I hope that people feel they've, given, they've been given the space by that, those people above them, the, the, the new leaders who are coming through now 
to um, behave with the values in the organization that they believe the organization should have. Um, one of the things I was interested in, you know, obviously we, 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 we talked about how well business is done because of its, you know, it, 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 its competence, its, its, ability to its ability to execute. Um, you know, another thing that we have, that we've, we, we have seen sort of, a, 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 probably with the, you know, the development of purpose and so on, a move towards longer term horizons, perhaps for companies, at least at least aspirational, and perhaps much shorter term horizons for the media, as we talked about, and for uh, and, and for government. Yeah, you know, we can uh, bury a story for a few weeks, nobody will care about it when it comes when it eventually comes out is certainly a theme that we've that we've seen. So yeah. how, how are those sort of horizon spans play into this, do you think? That is a really important question, particularly super relevant. So we're aware that, you know, I'm aware of the conversation I'm having with clients and partners. Many organizations right now, are, you know, they, they really are parallel tracking, you know, with what's going on in the world today, there's business continuity. There's, there's, a, there's immediate challenges that are in the next few weeks, in the next few days of how do we still function and what regions are we still functioning in, uh, as well as, critical long-term strategy that has to be maintained as well and uh so it, it's particularly it feels particularly apparent right now i think the ability to have a long-term horizon is, is really important and i think the value of clarity of purpose in organization is critical in that you know a north star that you your the products you make the services you sell might be very different but your purpose in the world may remain constant and in fact today i saw a post from um Jesper, who runs uh, Inca, one of the main parts of IKEA, referencing the founder. I think it was the founder's birthday. Their purpose has always been super clear. Super clear, which is they work towards a better everyday life for the many people. And originally that was the obvious. It was sofas you could afford. It was kitchen units that were affordable to most for people with thin wallets. And then as they're moving forward, it will change. It will be smart home facilities, you know, it will maybe, you know, mobile homes in future. It may be the way we might, you know, the mobility solution, whatever it might be, their purpose will remain constant. Now, in the short term, there'll be three, five-year plans that will oscillate around that. You know, that will include sustainability plans that will be much nearer to five-year plans with a long vision of, of course, a 2030 or 2040, but it you know, really is a five-year cycle. But that North Star, that purpose that enables you to do the long-term planning, to think about what's this company going, how, how, what shape do we need to be in in 100 years from now? It's really critical. And I think when we end up in these volatile times, often, of course, always the urgent feels more important than you become replaces the important. And the, one of the important things is that long term strategy planning, which sometimes gets neglected. Yeah. Can, I, do you, can I link? I was going to link two questions here because they're both sort of technical questions on the on the on the survey or, or um, digging down on the survey results. You know, did you see big differences in trust between large global businesses and smaller local businesses was one question and then this uh, and then a you know a, a second question on it really relates to the, the the patterns of trust you talked about the you know we've seen that big gap yawning gap between high and low income and that's and that's moving yeah it play out in different in different you know about who you trust is it playing out that the, the trust is particularly falling hardest in one particular area for those for, for those low income groups yeah um so the first question um it, i'm not so much the size of an organization it's the values and it's the behavior of the organization which is driving the trust um there's no doubt there is some cynicism of scale is bad you know a, a simplified um challenge that we face as large businesses um that there is a perception that big business, you know, is not working for me, that it's working for someone else, that I don't quite know who it's working for, but it's not me, um, that can be, that, that, that is often a start point. However, we are also seeing that big businesses do perform well when they behave well, when they demonstrate their values through what they do. Um, so I wouldn't say the size is the dominant factor in the performance um, of trust. Uh, 
the second question, sorry, my, my, the second question is there in my mind. Second question, for, you know, for, for that you, that widening gap between high and low income. Oh, yes. It, 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 is trust in different institutions, is the pattern of trust in different institutions playing out? So is that, you know, is the driver for the reduction in low being driven by, you know, rapidly decelerating trust in one particular institution? Yeah, we do see some discrepancy between markets. So we see a huge divide in North America between the high and low incomes, the, the more informed and uh, less informed um, citizens. Uh, we do see a difference, of course, one of the questions you asked earlier about government trust is obviously quite different as well in the, in the, in the system in which you live in. We do see that the, the trust in media varies a little bit. Often the uh, high income have got greater, that conversation we had earlier about understanding the broad sweep the media now is and differentiating between one another, differentiating between social media and media um, is more significant than in the lower income. Um, but we'll have to, I'll, probably, I'll try and dig in some data actually and maybe share with the group afterwards a bit more to that question, it's a very good question. Yeah, that would, I think that would be, we all we'll be interested in that. Look, here's a question that we ask ourselves kind of every day. It's in, our, it's in the, the words in the title of our, of, of our, in, 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 our, our institution here, but you know, ethics is sometimes a word that comes with some baggage. Um, mm. You know, how do you think the um, your the, the people you survey understand that word, and do you frame it for them, or or is it sort of um, free response? It's a really really good question. Um, I th so how do they understand the word? I th honestly, vaguely, and I think with great variation. Uh, some really big themes that come out. Ethics is fairness, and that is how people often express ethics in action is in fairness. And with that broadly, which is this is also a very big word, um, is justice. And they see that in terms of the way people are treated in business across its supply chain and value chain, very important. Um, justice in the way people may be kept to account within companies too and companies' behavior. Um, I think ethics also is about a consistency of performance for many of our, you know, they want to understand it's not a moment in time, it's something you've done over all my interactions with you, over an accumulation of direct interaction with you, whether it be direct or indirect, that there's some consistency in the values of which you've shown um, and that those values are based on uh, what we broadly would term, or with the people we talk to, would broadly term what is good for society. And of course, there's definition that's quite broad across society, but um, there are some universal values. That of course, I think most people, 99% of people do hold true. Um, so I, I hope that answers my, I think that, you know, it's a very complex word for most citizens to really grasp, but those are some of the, that's often how it comes out, expressed back to us. Yeah, yeah, it, well, it, it's, it means different things to different people. That's the, that is a perpetual challenge um, for us, that's for sure. Um, here's an interesting question, and apologies if I'm not strictly sticking to the, the, the voting order, but um, uh, is there less trust when government is more centralized? As we sort of flip-flop in the UK, um, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah, um, if we look at the data, there's more trust. In the last year, the centralized economy, I mean, I mean truly centralized, not, not kind of, yeah. you know, if you're looking at China versus UK, for example, yeah. um, there's more trust in those governments currently. And um, we should remember that data is from a, a market, as we mentioned at the start, where asking people surveys is not normal behavior, or especially we, we have to remember that, however, um, in climate, times of great change, which there's no doubt we've been living through for the last two and a half years, sometimes that command economy, that command center can be quite reassuring. Sometimes that speed of movement, speed of action, delivery on the ground, which can be achieved in that, can be quite reassuring when things are moving so fast around you. Um, so we were to just look at the data, Actually, it looks currently like that central command government is performing quite well for trust. I would say 
that data was from November last year. The last six weeks has obviously exposed quite a different um, uh, situation in the world and perhaps has uh, reminded people of elements of our own institutions in the West that we took for granted for so long that maybe it's not always that way and we have just had it thrown to stock um, reality of what the alternative can look like and so maybe those figures won't be quite the same next year that's my speculation by the way that's not in data it's just yeah prime comment so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well the, the, there's, there's always surprises every year so who, who knows what who, who knows what will how this will land um uh, one of the interesting thoughts and tell me if you think sorry one of the one of one of the thoughts it one of the things I thought was interesting that made me made me think in this is, um, you know, that importance of local communication. I'm thinking about the, the you know the 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 importance for companies. Um, you know, there's a, there's a risk that CEOs with multiple layers of of middle management between yeah. them and their front line should not take any comfort from this because the next step presumably is going to be that people only trust their local manager and don't trust the big boss uh, at, at, uh, at head office. And uh, I think, you know, many of us see, you know, we see that in, you can see that in, in employee, some of that in employee services, in employee surveys um, from time to time where there's strong, you know, local leadership. Yeah. Um, but you know, our companies do, what should companies be doing to address that? Because I, you know, I mean, a couple of things, you got to make sure that you know if you're if if you're empowering um, your your middle managers by making sure they are part of the communication process and you're giving them the Q and As and the little the little packs to 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 brief their teams that works really well because then they're hearing group messages from their immediate manager. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, you know it, they're, they're not always necess necessarily. Uh, and, and power to do that. So, you know, what should companies be doing to avoid um, the, you know, you know, these macro uh, challenges then playing out within their own com um, uh, companies? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It's obviously you know, a perpetual challenge to any institution of any size or any considerable size. Um, I think one thing to do is first of all, to stop talking and, and actually start listening. And to remember to listen, not to leadership, but to the people all the way through the organization. I think what you were touching on, Mark, in the question is inconsistency. And I've got a visionary CEO who I really do believe he doesn't or she doesn't seem to understand the behavior three levels down is not the behavior that he or she is telling us the other values of this business. And we all know, and we've all seen leadership teams who simply um, are. Uh, ill-informed of current performance, which is hugely dangerous because inconsistency drives mistrust and distrust. And then of course, that is then a vicious cycle where people then, this is your point, they don't feel empowered. They feel they've got permission then to take shortcuts and make the wrong decisions because they think there's no repercussions, all those. That so I think first of all, listen and listen beyond your own champions. Listen beyond those you've promoted into positions of power, listen to the people directly and just understand your current state of play. And then I think your point around, okay, well, let's, once you understand, what, what would you do to ensure there is consistency? I think you have to be absolutely clear what the values are of the business. And that's the, and then from the values, you should get the behaviors corrected. And with the behaviors being consistent, hopefully you should then have um, that ability for all levels of management, um, all levels of participation to, work in accord with the, the leadership direction that has been set, the values have been set, the, the ethical ethical structures that they want to operate within. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I, I would just hope that people take a moment to ensure they are, they're not listening to the 10%, but they listen to all to make sure they are performing consistently. Yeah, and I think that sort of segues a bit, yeah, yeah I mean, this, this perpetual challenge of, an expectation for business to engage in the uh, in the issues facing society, but the you know the danger that you get dragged into an issue, whether it's political or not, that that is politicised by its nature, 
um, the, the, the risk that you actually haven't got anything meaningful to say about it, and therefore your contribution is nothing more than, 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 than greenwash. Yes. Um, and, and the issue that you are unduly influenced by the, you know, the, the, the single issue groups who are passionate and very vocal about it, um, but don't necessarily, you know, you know, how can you be sure that that reflects the view, the, 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 the views of your, um, of your workforce uh, as, as a whole? So yeah, listening is the answer to it, but um, it, it, it's, it, it's hard for organizations to, to pick, you know, to pick the, the issues. Uh, what should they be? T the, the, what should they be talking about? If they're trying to ground it by reference to what's important to their business, if they're trying to ground it to their values, that will be a good starting point. But do you think people have learned a bit from the last couple of months um, about how to frame these issues? Because suddenly there've been issues with really, you know, big stakes around them. These are not casual communicate casual communications or casual decisions to be to be made i think they have and i think that there was um i hope they have uh, and, and it's this, this, always a challenge when do we step up and step forward and when do we patch contrary behind the scenes and when is there times that we, we really don't have a meaningful contribution to make this isn't our issue um you're right of course the effectiveness of single issue pressure groups or single issue organizations who are doing their job. That is their job to push the agenda. That's exactly what they're there to do. But of course, business has to look at the, the situation in a holistic fashion. And unfortunately, the world isn't black and white. And often many issues have got multifaceted aspects to them. And, and sometimes unintentionally by doing one thing, you might uh, cause other harm elsewhere um, unintentionally. Uh, what would what would be good advice? Good advice would be, understanding truly the scale of the issue in society is this really a significant need that we should step into and when we say we should we step into it is is this aligned to our own strategic direction in terms of where we are performing and the reason that's relevant is can we contribute in a way which is meaningful do we add value to problem solving here or are we simply just another voice in the room shouting or are we going to come in meaningfully and contribute to finding a solution that is proportional to the scale of the problem that we're saying is is present then i think it is also right to then from that ask are we credible you know on that front are we credible do we understand enough about this issue or do are we working with a partner who helps us understand enough about this issue to mean that we're coming and adding to the solution rather than just again making the room busier um and finally it's then probably being realistic about often you know we do have a challenge where companies want praise for everything and sometimes the citizens rightly shouldn't give you a pat on the back for doing something that they think you should have been doing anyway so do the work for those occasionally when you deserve it you should maybe go out and ask for praise or let people know you're doing it but more importantly do the work demonstrate impact make sure you are solving the problem um, and then the praise will come of course and you can help amplify that if you'd like to through messaging um, but perhaps don't expect praise for every action you take, because we can see the expectation on businesses that you should be taking action anyway. Um, so that's an area of caution too. How, how do you think this is going to? Well, um, you know, I was, I was struck on a, 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 a panel that uh, Edelman ran ran a few weeks ago with you know with, with Sir John Sawyer's on, uh, and you know thinking about those the big decision that. Uh, that BP had to make, and I think BP, we, we certainly we may have a delegate from BP on. So, um, but uh, you know, the broader question is: Do you think that the boards should be looking again at <clears throat> their skill set round the table uh, and some of these, you know, broader societal reach, broader geopolitical reach, broader and longer term uh, issues? How are you bringing that? How are you how are you bringing expertise into the boardroom? Um, and if you haven't got it around the table, you know, are, are boards doing enough to, you know, to find people who can help um, in, inform their decision making? What, what, what's your impression? Is there, has there been a bit of a scramble as a result of what's happened? I think that there is um, a long term trend, which is very good to recognise that having boards of people with the same lived experiences is not going to give you the most rich conversation, the most rich decision making. And over the longer term, the better performance. In the short term, obviously, what's happening right now, 
the scramble to get in the sources of expertise on something which is really an incredibly complex situation is you know clearly immediate and trying to make sure you are getting sound counsel for what are hugely significant strategic decisions that are being taken in incredibly short periods of time um, require you to listen carefully to people who can be the best judge of what may happen. Of course, the truth is none of us know what's going to happen. That's the truth. We're just having to make the most smartly informed um, and uh, <laughs> smartly informed guesses, quite frankly, at the moment, you know, because it's, 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 it's an unknown. Um, and in the long term, I think boards should definitely look to give bringing the, the skills that reflect the world that we're facing into, not the facing the world we're coming from. And we should be very work very hard to make sure those skills and the experiences of the around the board table are as diverse as possible in the in, in all aspects, in all ways, to ensure that you are um, really delivering into a dialogue with one another with, of, of views and opinions that reflect your customers, your consumers, all your stakeholders in which you are now operating, including your own workforce. Yeah. Um, we've got a question about, uh, you know, the role of those involved in communication and, mm. and you know, what, what can your, you know, particularly your, uh, the people in your organization doing those roles and the external bodies that you use to, to help you with communication, um, how can we, um, uh, you know, address this uh, truth decay, but at the same time, you know, not not just undermine it by seeing be being seen as just uh, the corporate spin machine. I mean, I, 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 and and I think it you know it also goes to that sort of uh, you know quite often there's quite a a difference between what's going through the internal comms channel <laughs> and what's going through the external comms channel. Which yes, find, you know, that's pretty unsatisfactory when you see that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. It's critical. It's critical. You know, we, it, we have to hold ourselves to account to always deliver clear, true, um, understandable information to all. And you know, so the first part of call is to interrogate briefs. You know, those of us working in-house at companies, those of us advising those who are working in-house at companies, to interrogate briefs truly and to really question, is this, is this absolutely right what you're claiming here? And is your state of ambition going to match with a plan of action? Is there progress behind this that is true? Um, and can we really account for this? So we must start with that. We must interrogate the community, what we are trying to communicate and the depth of it. And we should talk to stakeholders across the business who are responsible for the things we're communicating around to ensure there has no been, has been either not lost in translation or exaggerated in translation. Um, and then we must keep the information, as I say, regularly updated. As always, you know, it's on all of us to deliver truth. I think there's some questions about, you know, how do we help media? You know, that's on them too. Every time one person within the industry fails on that, they undermine, you know, the trust in communications full stop. Yeah. And that clearly we're seeing the effect of that in the data we just ran through. So um, on all of us, it's beholden to ensure that the, the, the quality of the information we're sharing um, and the clarity of the response we give. And that includes if someone comes back for more information or has a question that we also respond to that, you know, that we that we get open up and engage on a topic, then don't be surprised if there's a dialogue because that's that's how the world works now. Before it maybe was more broadcast, of course it's different. So we shouldn't be shutting conversations down that we've opened up ourselves. The, the, there's a there's a question here about you know the um, the the line manager that is uh, the Maverick line manager, the one who doesn't tow, tow the line. I mean, I think we know for, for all sorts of reasons, you can't have a communication cascade that's going to work. You can't have a cascade, you can't have any, frank, frankly, any, any uh, um, you know, delegation of the, of the standards that you want to have um, from above if you've got people who are just not following the, culture and not being measured and held accountable for for their behaviors but I, but I, you know I, th I think maybe if the risk of slightly rephrasing or re-emphasizing the question I wonder you know are we doing enough to support our middle managers with this communication role 
um, you know, I've seen it, as I said, some of the tools are helpful. If you give mm. people you know, toolkits and you, and, 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 and cascade calls and so on, but, you know, many organizations don't have time for that. And, and all you get is, you know, there's a message issued from above and an encouragement to talk about it at your next team meeting. That's not mm. tremendously helpful to the, to the middle manager. So what, what would you encourage organizations to do to, to truly empower their middle managers? Do you know what, Mark? I think it actually goes back to what you said earlier when we were talking about finance bosses, regulated industries. I'm actually not, I'm not sure that's so much of a communications challenge that we, and by the way, I think the talking about middle management is absolutely the right audience that is, finds it hardest because they're probably, they're at the pinch point between senior and, and the, the, the doers. With, they're the busiest, they have a whole range of short-term targets as well as these long-term aspirations of the business pushed upon them. But I think the bits are really missing is giving them the structures and the governance within the organization that allows them to turn the communication into behaviors of their teams. And that's where they find it hard when they've been asked to relay a message that their own team say six months later, nothing's changed. You know, it's very, it's wonderful you gave us a new piece of wall art and a PowerPoint. But the behavior I'm seeing around the business and from you yourself is exactly what it was six months ago. Yeah. So I think the challenge is more that we equip them with um, the change in how the business then shapes itself, the culture it sets at play, and they feel empowered with those tools to turn the words into the behaviors they want to see in their team. And they can empower their teams to deliver those behaviors. Um, and I think that's where they feel the most squeezed when they really feel like they've been given um vacuous statements that they can't back up in their own management of that team yeah yeah um what are ngos doing what have they done in the last um you know since we last talked that that has helped move the bar for them they're moving in the right direction they are they've obviously had an incredibly tough time they've had a real funding shock um as uh, you know, as, as the world had its shocks uh, starting in early 2020. And they also had a serious funding shock for most NGOs. The NGOs probably have been seen more in the last two years as we were dealing with a global pandemic. Their work on the ground, their work in communities nearest to us all has become much more obvious and understood. Um, and right now, of course, that will be continued with you know, certainly from um, a Western viewpoint, the work that's being done, heroic work that's being done on the ground to help with the humanitarian crisis out of Ukraine, is again making people see again the work that perhaps we overlooked. So I think that some of the, the reason that they have moved is people are seeing the results of their actions more visibly. So their competence level has shifted up. I don't think they struggle with a view of whether they were ethical, but they did struggle with a view of whether they were competent. And having people experience that competence in recent years, <clears throat> by seeing the impact in their local and, and slightly more distant communities, they've risen. And they've had a tough time. And as a sector, they deserve you know, all the praise they get because um, they are still in a tough time because funding is still very challenging for them um, and yet needs are greater than ever. So um, it's good to see them moving the right way. And um, we probably have to make sure that they also aren't overburdened, that there is not too much expectation for them to deliver things that... Um, they're not meant to deliver on a permanent basis. Yeah, but I do think it's a, I do think it's a, you know, it's a stakeholder group that companies kind of overlook sometimes. Uh, you know, there's questions in here about, you know, what could we do to, what could we do to, um, uh, you know, influence, uh, to combat the impact of social media? How, how could we be influencing government and media to improve trust in those institutions? But actually we, we, we rarely ask, are we doing enough with NGOs that are uh, actually incredibly well trusted yeah. that just help to be to run themselves better and, yeah. and that help to be as professional as they would like, uh, yeah. as they would like to be? Um, you know, it seems to me there's a there's a big that that's a um, uh, that's a group of institutions that companies have have perhaps not chosen to partner with. So rather, how can you know, rather than how can we partner with institutions that are going backwards, uh, you know, um, should we be doing more to partner with institutions 
institutions that are moving forwards and having success. I think I mean, yeah, that's absolutely right. And obviously the NGO world in the last 10 years has done a huge amount to develop its partnership capacity and it's developed its partnership skills. And I mean that with, with corporates in mind. You know, they have worked really hard to understand how better do we work with um, corporate partners to deliver on common strategies, shared strategies, that perhaps they were not they were they, they were not so experienced with previously. They were, you know, recruitment drives in that in that direction, and they are far better at it. And then equally from a corporate th philanthropy perspective, which is not, I know you're not just talking about corporate, corporate, corporate th philanthropy, but there's also an understanding and a move to giving the NGO leaders more autonomy. And that, you know, there was often, you know, ne never would we fund the core costs of an NGO because we can, you know, be abused and so on. There's change in that now, recognizing these people are closest to the needs. They understand these far better than we do. They're dealing with it every day, their workforce. Um, they probably got, these are really smart people who are very dedicated. They've got real skill sets to manage their organization brilliantly. Um, maybe we shouldn't be so patronizing and saying they can't, we won't support it. And I think there's a shift in the way the partnerships on both sides uh, is being approached now from greater and improved skills within NGOs and greater trust from corporates in those NGOs to deliver the impact we want to see in their way, giving them the, um, the empowering them to build the solution out as they see fit, because they're the closest to both, both aspects, the issue itself and the solutions that are most effective. I, I think we're, you know, we're almost out of time. Um, so perhaps let's um, just to end. I, I want to ask you to get your sort of crystal ball out and guess what you think the scores are going to be ne next next year. I don't think that's fair. But you know, if if we all had um, you know thirty seconds in an ele elevator with our chief executives or our chairman uh, 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 sometime over the next week, what should we be encouraging them to do that would at least ensure our business is our, our, our best place here? What what are the what are your key takeaways from uh, an action list for them? I think that when we're living in times when the winds feel, of change feel so strong around us, the importance of what you hinted at earlier, Mark, of having long-term strategies and a long-term vision that we un we understand is robust. We've this has been um, hasn't been smashed together. This has been thought through, and reiterating that for people in times of change. Um, is empowering for them and reassuring for them. I think that being clear about our role in the world because of that is really significant when we are going to face a whole lot of issues economically, socially, geographically, geopolitically in the next few years. And giving the, the CEO confidence that we would like to hear more from them. They're individuals too. They're people who feel overwhelmed by change, who feel overwhelmed by what they're seeing on the news, who feel overwhelmed by their inbox. Um, so, you know, let's not forget that. And so let's also give them the confidence and the reassurance that you'd like to hear more from them, that you'd like them to come to you with questions about what should we do on this um, and make sure they feel empowered by the organisation to step forward because we can see your stakeholders would like that. And, and if our you know, decision making on priorities and our, and our public statement on issues of the day is framed constantly in the, con in the context of our purpose, our longer term objectives and the values of the organisation, you know, that significantly diffuses the politicisation risk, it diffuses the, um, uh, the greenwashing risk as well. So yes. you know, it, it feels like now is a time where those things should be front and center for everything that everyone's doing. Totally. And, and really practically, you know, with that clarity, you speed up decision making yeah. because people are empowered to understand the direction the business needs to go. And what we do know is that there's going to be a lot of decisions that have to be made in the next six months because of what's the change that's happening around us. Um, and if, you're, if there's a paralysis in the organization, then uh, that could be deeply harmful, uh, both operationally culturally and then reputationally great good point to end uh look thank you mark it it, it was um a uh you know fantastic gallop through what is an extraordinary piece of work and and, and a multi-dimensional analysis of of a a, a complex 
topic. I think there's been loads to think about, loads for us to take away. I would encourage people do have a look at the slides in more detail. Do go to the Edelman site and look at the at the full deck. Um, that, that there's loads there. But thank you, Mark, for for guiding it through us, and thank you for for taking those questions. Really, uh, very much appreciate your your time again, and, th and thanks once more. Uh, just you. before we close, uh, yeah, we will put these this the the we'll make the slides available. A recording of this will be available on our website and our YouTube site. Um, a couple of quick plugs for upcoming events for your uh, for your diaries. We have um, uh, our next training is a masterclass in designing effective codes of ethics. Whether you're there about the latest thinking and recent trends in how codes of ethics are designed, that's on the 5th of April, so please book now. And then um, we will have, uh, uh, Mike Tuffery is going to um, be coordinating a panel of involving our chair and a couple of our trustees um, to talk about how ethics and culture help can help businesses be sustainable. That, so that's ethical culture, a critical foundation for sustainable business. And that event is on the 28th of April. You can get details on our website. Um, so please book up for that. If you can bear staying on for another couple of minutes just to complete the feedback survey, that would be enormously helpful. These events are designed with you in mind. So if you if if you have any feedback, um, we'd love to hear it so we can make these events as useful as possible to our audience. But meanwhile, have a great afternoon and thank you for joining.